Hello, everyone. Depending on what time you are joining us, this is either morning or afternoon for you. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited that you're here and um, just so grateful. Um, every time we do these workshops, I'm so, so grateful for teachers who have this wonderful summer break and they're here learning with us. So I'm really, really excited. I'm so grateful that you're here. So thank you again. Um, as we're hopping in here, um, looks like we still have quite a few people joining and uh, I'll wait for us to, to kind of let those numbers settle, but we're gonna drop a couple of links into the chat. And um, the first one is a question parking lot. This is actually going to serve to help us today to uh, not only have all of the questions uh, that you may, may have uh, questions throughout the course of our presentation today, but also the links that we're gonna be sharing out. So uh, the bulk of the links are going to be right there in that web development uh, question parking lot or live Q&A. So some more people joining us here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make sure everyone can see this. So this is what the question parking lot uh, looks like. Portia threw it into the chat for us, but you can see um, the attendance link is here. We have some sign up links um, and some uh, a link to my slides if you'd like to take a look at those already. And then some more information about that web development workshop that we're gonna be working through today or the web development course. So please, please, please go ahead and feel free to hop into that questions document. Thank you so much. My name is Linda. I'm just gonna introduce myself. I'm a PD specialist here at Code HS, and um, I work with an amazing team of PD specialists. I was a previous teacher, uh, taught for 15 years, um, web design, uh, programming, and also AP computer science principles. So um, I am joined today by a PD specialist, uh, two, three PD specialists, forgive me, um, MR, Joni, and Portia. So I'm just gonna let them uh, introduce themselves in that order. I think you said me. Hey guys, I was answering some questions in chat already. Um, yeah, welcome you guys. Excited to be able to be with you here today. Um, my name is Joni. I am one of the PD specialists and I too have spent a bunch of time, about 27 years in the classroom and looking forward to working with you guys. Hey everyone, my name is MR. I'm from Chicago and I currently live here as well. Um, I taught English language arts and English as a second language for several years in Chicago K-12 community center virtual environments. So kind of a different pathway. Um, I spent a lot of time meeting students where they're at. Um, you know, if they come, they came to me like six levels below their reading level, that's fine. We work with it. And when it came to Code HS, I learned programming in kind of the same way. And um, Yes, yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time adapting curriculum for special needs, language learners, and at-risk students. That's that's kind of my jam. And I'm really excited to get people excited about teaching computer science in their classrooms. I think it's a really important skill, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody. My name is Portia Morell. I am, like, brand new to the team. Um, I My background is in computer science. I was a computer science teacher in the classroom for the past five years and now I'm on the PD team. So I love CompSci um, and I'm just here to help you. <laughs> Pass it back on to Linda. All right, thank you so much. We still have people joining, but um, we're gonna keep throwing the links into the chat. Um, there is the QR code if you wanna have maybe, you know, the questions um, on your phone while you leave uh, that free for your, your desktop or laptop. Um, that's totally fine. So I put the QR code there on our slide. I'm going to go ahead and move on, though, because we got an opportunity to introduce ourselves, but I want you to introduce yourself because um, I want to learn about a little bit more about you. Um, so where are you joining us from? What do you teach? Um, tell me a little bit more, more about yourself. We've had an international crowd uh, joining our PDs this summer, so I'm really, really excited to meet everyone. All right, so we've got South, South Carolina. Nice to meet you. Tucson, okay, second year CS teacher. Orlando, Florida, that's very close to me. I am actually based in Melbourne, Florida. 
Athens, Greece, amazing. All right, welcome everyone. India teaching, let's see, ICT HTML, excellent. Las Vegas, Nevada, St. Petersburg. Kentucky, welcome, welcome. Swami, nice to meet you, welcome. All right, Massachusetts, we've got quite a crowd today and thank you so much um, everyone for dropping into the chat, letting us know a, a little bit more about yourself. We really wanna know, um, okay, greetings from Panama. Oh my goodness, um, I actually lived in Panama for a time. My family's from there, welcome. All right, joining from Arkansas, Chicago, North Carolina. Excellent, so excited to see everybody. So um, again, thank you so much for joining. We are going to uh, continue to uh, be able to in network with one another. If you have some time to, as we do our breakouts, um, to go ahead and, and spend some time with other teachers, this is a really great time to network as well. Um, thank you again for um, just carving out some time. I know it's your summer, so um, we're uh, here to assist you and help you in whatever way we can. So let me go ahead and we're going to go ahead and uh, talk through a little bit about what you're going to be seeing today. Um, so the first and foremost, um, first thing we'll do is we'll get you set up with, uh, hopefully, uh, if you don't already have an account with CodeHS, uh, we can get you set up there. We'll enroll you in a workshop section, which includes the entire web development course. So if you'd like, uh, you're actually viewing that as a student today. And you're gonna be able to work through that, those modules if you'd like to um, throughout the course of your summer. Um, and definitely it is a very robust curriculum. So um, we want you to have some time to play around with that. We're gonna talk a little bit about what CodeHS is. Um, we're also going to look at a, uh, actually a one of the uh, web development lessons from the student perspective. We're going to look through some course catalog and um, also talk about some tools and resources. We actually have two sessions. One is going to uh, be the main session. We'll, we'll talk about some Code HS teacher tools and resources. And then we have a breakout session where we are just going to be chatting about curriculum. So um, stay tuned for that. That's a little bit more informal, but it's a space for us to be able to ask a little bit more about the actual course. So if you haven't done so already, I know there were a lot of people that just joined and are continuing to join. So I wanna make sure that if you have not uh, gone to the links and live Q&A, um, that is the link there. You can go, navigate out to codehs.com forward slash web dev dash questions. And this is what you'll see. You can see everybody here uh, joining kind of incognito and um, you have all of the links that you'll need for this particular presentation. So very excited to have you here. All right. So um, something that we need to do uh, just to kind of ensure that everybody has an account with CodeHS, you're going to want to sign up for a CodeHS teacher account. Um, when you get to this page, know that there are two pathways, one for teacher, one for student. So make sure that you choose the teacher pathway and that you set up a free account if you this is your first time with CodeHS. Um, this is an excellent time to go ahead and uh, set up your account. Let us know if you're having any issues. Um, generally, you'll need to be verified as a teacher before you'll have access to the teacher resources. Um, and there is a little bit of a process to do that, but we'll get that turned around as quickly as we can for you. All right, once you have um, gone ahead and set up your teacher account, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Um, for those that have a CodeHS teacher account, um, you're going to want to log into it for me. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to click this link for the attendance. This is actually a way for us to, we don't collect any information. We're just simply um, using this information uh, to know how many people were here and also send out PD certificates. So we do send out um, certificates for the two hours that you were here with us. And uh, we want to make sure you get those uh, hopefully by the end of today, if not tomorrow, you should see that come through. Um, also, I know there were a couple of questions in the chat. Will I receive the, the recording? Absolutely. Um, and we'll be sending out all the resources also that we'll be sharing with you today. So no worries if, uh, if you're like, hey, I'm jotting down notes as quickly as I can, Linda, can you slow down? Don't worry, we're gonna send this uh, a little bit later. So no, no problem. 
All right, let's take a look here. Um, once you've set up your teacher account, um, then what you want to do is you want to enroll in our workshop section. And like I said, this is the course that will be included. Uh, it, it will include the entire web development course, but it will also include some workshop materials from today. Um, so let me just navigate out to that real quick. Um, if you go to codehs.com forward slash go forward slash C44F7, you should see um, the four of us listed as teachers and you will see the web development course there. So um, as we navigate out to it, you're going to see that at the very top, um, there is a workshop resources. So you can see the slides, the resources, the survey, everything that we kind of uh, walked through today. I put in the links in live Q&A here. So if you would like to click on those links from there, that's a really excellent document to go to. And then all of the modules included with the web development course are in this workshop section. So go ahead, if you're having any trouble at all getting into the workshop section, let one of us know, okay? Um, so we can make sure uh, that you're enrolled and that you have all the resources that you need we will also be utilizing this course. Uh, MR is going to go through some curriculum with you. We're going to go through a couple of sample lessons. So I want to make sure that you are able to access this, that sample lesson, and that's going to be in that workshop section. Again, go to codehs.go, I'm sorry, for codehs.com forward slash go forward slash C, uh, C44F7. You can also join uh, by the join code on the bottom left corner of your screen if you're already logged into CodeHS and just click on join by code and you'll be able to put in that C44F7. Okay, Rachel says, I'm seeing a project to build your own resume. Very cool, yeah. A lot of real world projects. I really love this course. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive in, thank you. That was a segue. Um, we're gonna take a look at the CodeHS course catalog. There's a lot there, but um, what I want you to do is we're going to focus in on um, a couple of courses, the web design, JavaScript course, and also the web development course. Um, so as you take a look at this course catalog, you're going to be able to see um, that we have a couple of filters up here. Um, the one, unfortunately, that we don't have is web design, but what we can do is we can just simply look for web development and you'll see it right there. I'll also toss out the link to you. Um, there will be a couple of other courses. If you have the slides, there are live links also with embedded within those slides. Just go to the question uh, document and you'll see it there. So for web design, um, we currently offer, uh, and these would be the prerequisite courses, or um, really it's a courses within the pathway of web development. We recommend that students have um, a little bit of an understanding or a lot of understanding of web design and JavaScript. Um, this course really is a pretty advanced course um, when I'm talking about the web development course. So a couple of recommendations to start out with web design and intro to programming with JavaScript. Um, so we have three different flavors of web design. So um, you can see the really the only difference is the amount of contact hours and um, oftentimes the levels of uh, those particular courses. So I won't belabor those, uh, but just know that we do have a web design course and those cover um, HTML and CSS as well as some may cover advanced CSS. Um, in addition, you have, uh, it's recommended that your students complete the Intro to Computer Science and JavaScript course. Um, so we do have our flagship course, which is Intro to Computer Science and JavaScript. We start out with those Carol modules and move into advanced JavaScript. Let's dive into the actual web development course, though. So I really wanted to kind of talk through this one a little bit more. Um, it's important to note that this is <clears throat> considered a capstone course. So really, um, most students would finish uh, either the web design and the JavaScript course first, or it's possible that uh, they could, in, in, in essence, use this as uh, a standalone course. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So um, Portia is going to drop this into, or she already dropped it into the chat for us, but this is where you can view the syllabus and also uh, the basic uh, web development page that we've set up. So if I go there, you can see um, there is a page that kind of walks you through. It has a link to the syllabus as well as uh, all of the modules kind of laid out with more information, uh, more detailed information on what students will be seeing in this course. 
So I invite you to open up those links and make sure uh, you take a look at those offerings. So the web development course is considered a one year course. Um, so when we're looking for um, web development material, remember um, your pathway um, kind of follows, you know, the uh, web design then in uh, JavaScript, and this would be considered a full year course. We have uh, the course, you know, focuses primarily on how students can use uh, JavaScript in tandem with HTML and CSS. So they are creating dynamic, responsive websites. In those web design courses that I showed you just a minute ago, those courses are helping students to create what's called a static page. And MR is gonna get into what the difference between a static page and a dynamic page is in just a moment. But generally, we're uh, talking about incorporating both JavaScript uh, and HTML and CSS to create these responsive websites that um, somebody can interact with and um, also input data into. So the course is intended to be, you know, a third in the web development pathway. And as I've been saying, it builds off of their former knowledge of JavaScript and HTML and CSS. So um, this would be, uh, you know, it could be any course in JavaScript and HTML, but we really recommend uh, that they begin with the code HS versions of these courses. Um, the other option too, um, students may be taking courses, you know, um, they may take the intro to JavaScript course and web design, or if they've taken also AP computer science principles in JavaScript, um, they can also uh, utilize that as a prerequisite and then uh, web design as well. So something to note, uh, you know, what really makes this course stand out is that it uses project based learning to assess students. So, you know, generally throughout the course, you're going to see some pretty complex projects, and this is based on topics that they have recently covered. So um, you should see a project in every module. These projects also include a rubric. So each project is equipped with uh, this rubric that explicitly states what the students uh, need to do in order to earn the points. So um, the student expectations are kind of laid out uh, for them. You'll be able to not only evaluate them using this criteria, but they will also have peer review portions um, within those projects. So they need to be able to not only uh, have their website evaluated, but also evaluate others' websites as well. So the project kind of all of the projects emulate this real world web development scenarios. And so uh, I know someone in the chat said there's an interactive resume and uh, that is really, really just a great way for your students to incorporate real world uh, scenarios and help prepare them to create more intricate websites. So um, the, there are exercises to learn and practice just like in any other Code HS course. Um, but this course really puts a large emphasis on students developing their own websites that are fully responsive and interactive. So just know that they're, it's project heavy. So the course is broken down into six distinct modules, and then there's a culminating project at the end. The first module introduces how JavaScript is used in web development. So students are introduced to the script tag, um, the document uh, object model, uh, document object model, forgive me, I cannot speak today, I should have just said DOM, um, and how they can create the and manipulate HTML objects to dynamically alter those web pages. By the end of the module, students will be able to create an interactive keyboard from scratch, so using only JavaScript. Um, so what you see um, is our ability to actually add uh, HTML and CSS elements only using JavaScript. In module two, students will be introduced to jQuery. So um, that's a lightweight and uh, you know very capable JavaScript library. But um, I will say jQuery is kind of, if you've take, had uh, or taught the web design course, it's kind of equivalent to having uh, standard CSS versus Bootstrap, where you actually have a library of commands now that students can work with. So students learn how these libraries can be incorporated into their website and how to read the documentation so that they can learn how to effectively use that library. So using those newfound skills in 
jQuery and JavaScript and their advanced HTML and CSS, um, their first project is to build an interactive resume. So students learn um, what makes a good resume and attempt to create one that allows users to interact with that information that's provided. So it's a pretty cool uh, exercise for them to do, especially if they are, um, you know, uh, ready to either uh, enter the workforce or go into uh, college application uh, process. This is a really great option. In module four, um, students learn how to collect and store data. And so um, something that students are going to be able to do is um, they are going to be able to store their data in real time. They use this cloud-based database called Firebase. So each student is given a segment of the CodeHS Firebase database um, that they can use to store data from individual projects. So if there's any kind of a login, um, there will be a data collection type of process. So students are gonna learn how to use local and session storage, and then kind of weigh the dangers of, of data collection against what the potential benefits of storing data would be. So um, again, this is going to also culminate in a project um, that is used. It's called the data collection project where students create a website that collects simple data from the users, such as clicks and ratings. And then students learn about data-driven decision-making and how you know, they can use data analytics to uh, make informed changes to their website. So this is um, really a great segue to into maybe a user experience or user interface design and how those all kind of fit together. Um, the design, the development portion, and then also the data portion. So students will create user personas based on the data that they collect from the users to predict what how their site's going to be used and um, potentially how that needs to be modified. Um, the last module is where students are, are going to learn how to build and maintain uh, a website. And the, this module covers different ways that students can buy domains, what to consider when naming your website, the different services available to host a website, and the pros and cons of, of using them versus trying to host them on your own. So if they want to use something like Squarespace versus um, a self-hosted site, um, students are encouraged to explore these options, but again, they are not expected to leave CodeHS uh, or the CodeHS editor um, to do any of these web development exercises. These are just more uh, information for them to be able to make informed decisions about creating their own websites in the future. And then finally, just an important note is there are two bootcamp modules that can be used to refresh student knowledge on their basic HTML and JavaScript. So I think at the beginning I said, hey, it could be a standalone course, and this is how you would do that. Um, you would need to add those modules in. They're not necessarily um, added automatically. So it's important uh, to note that there are also, you know, these two modules. Uh, they can be added to the beginning of the course, but there is already um, built into the course a pre-test evaluation. So this tests student knowledge in both languages. And depending on how students do on the exam, you may want to assign these units to them for extra practice. Um, you may want to, you know, have some of your students working through those specific modules while the others are kind of diving in. Um, the way that you would do that, um, when we look at the assignments for the web development course, you can see they're all here kind of listed, including the final project. After the final project, you'll see this search for content, and you'll be able to assign the two bootcamp modules. You'll just need to reorder the modules, and um, if you stick around for the teacher tools and uh, teacher, teacher tools and resources, we'll talk about how you can reorder those as well. So just know that's available. But I want to uh, go ahead and hand it off to MR. Um, she's going to be walking us through a sample web development lesson. So we're really excited. And uh, make sure that you're enrolled in that course. If you, again, navigate out to the questions, um, you're going to see it right here. Join the workshop section. Forgive me, I am highlighting while everyone's trying to click. Um, you can go ahead and click on that workshop section. If you joined late, um, the way that you would get to uh, this particular document is you go to codehs.com forward slash web dev dash questions and you'll be able to get there. All right. Thanks, Linda. Just going to take one sec to get my screen set up. 
All right, I think that should be good. Okay, so uh, before we go down, in case you're new to CodeHS, um, as we dive into the course, here's just a brief overview of how the CodeHS courses are structured from both the teacher and student perspective. So this is going to be um, across the site, any course that you'll end up teaching. Courses are broken down into modules um, or units. And then those modules or units are broken down into lessons. Expanding each module, you can see all the lessons included in the unit. So for this first module in web development, um, we've got in this screenshot only eight, but I think there's maybe 12 or 16 lessons. But each module, when you expand it, will have every lesson listed. And then lessons are then broken down into assignments or activities. Most courses will start with a video, have a check for understanding or a formative assessment quiz. Um, usually one or two coding examples that students can explore and modify. And we're gonna see all this in action as well. Coding exercises where students practice the coding. And then some lessons will also have more involved challenge coding exercises. So you can expect those to take maybe one or two class sessions that involve um, synthesizing different concepts. A lot of the exercises are you know, kind of contained, but the challenges will have them um, throughout the course work on things that are maybe a little more advanced and synthesizing multiple concepts that they've learned so far. There also might be a longer unit quiz in some modules, sometimes articles or external connections and other activity types depending on the content. But for today, we're gonna to focus on web development. And um, so again, this course is pretty advanced. Um, the prereq knowledge is definitely JavaScript and CSS and HTML. But if you don't have that currently today, that's okay, just try to follow along and focus on the techniques. And if you're a little rusty, that's totally fine too. We won't really do a ton of coding, um, just sort of focusing on the, on the techniques here. Um, so I saw Portia dropped the lesson in the chat if you wanna follow along and here's all the activities in that lesson and we'll break them down. Here we go. So the first one is gonna be a video functions in HTML, and then the check for understanding quiz. Those are usually like two or three questions just to um, make sure that they understand, you know, what they watch or what they absorb. And um, you can use them in your grading however you want, but it, it, it's just, um, it's really just to see if they understood the concepts. And if they don't, it's a, they always provide um, answers to the questions so they can correct it right away. Um, then we have two coding examples that I'll go over. So these are, like pre-written code that they can test and play around with and modify and see what happens. And then this lesson has three coding exercises where um, they're given a little starter code sometimes, but mostly they are writing their own code and solving a problem using what they learned in the lesson uh, presentation at the beginning. Okay, so I'm gonna put on my teacher hat and as you participate, switch between your student and teacher lens. The goal of this lesson is to give you an idea of how this lesson can be taught rather than you learning the specific content because this is kind of the middle of the lesson. You know, don't expect yourself to walk away from this knowing exactly how to complete everything that we go over today. Um, with your student lens, consider what it's like to go through these activities. And then with your teacher lens, just kind of reflect on the moves I make and how you can use the site and leverage it to make sure that you're getting the content out. So you can also consider how you would approach each section similarly or differently to how I'm doing it and what would work best for your kids. So keep in mind that students are coming to this course with the basic understanding of the programming. Um, if you're new and you get a little lost, no worries. Just try to follow along with, uh, with me and with the exercises and, and we'll, you know, we'll wrap it up at the end and it's okay if you don't completely follow along with the coding. And at the end of the lesson, I'm gonna talk through some of the resources that I use to plan it. So, First thing we'll do, um, start with an opening discussion question. So reading the above code, what does the above HTML code do? Answer this in the chat. What does the above HTML code do? Let's try to read that code and take a guess as to what it does. Great, yeah, creates a button, creates a button named click me. Awesome, yeah. Um, this just creates a clickable button on a website on your page. 
And by default, nothing happens when you click the button. It'll just be a tangible button that the user can click. I'm sure you've seen these on websites when you like submit a form or press search. Um, you can uh, just click it, it, but it doesn't automatically have a function. Really good. Okay. So here's it looks like on the bottom there. Click me. That's what the button would look like when that page, when that code is put on the HTML page. Um, so above on this slide are some sample buttons from the CodeHS site. Notice how they're all styled differently, but as the user, you can expect to click any button and have that specific action happen. Um, so buttons are really good for user experience because they expect something to happen when they click a button immediately. So in this case on the CodeHS, the one on the left would um, create a new sandbox project. In the middle there, you can log in or you can sign up and each of those have a pretty ex explicit um, instruction or action that they're gonna do. In the chat, what are some more HTML buttons you can think of? As you're browsing websites or even using apps, what are some more button ideas that you can think of? Reset, excellent. Like if you have a calculator or something, you can reset your um, calculations, log out, perfect, submit. Yep, if you're filling out a form, uh, contact form, for example, you can submit that. And then you know, as the user, you're kind of used to this function where if you submit it, you know it's gonna go off to whoever, you know, you're intending to receive it. Next, back, enter, clear. Awesome, yeah. Um, something I noticed about all these is that they are very, um, uh, they're just actions, you know, so it's, it's all something that you expect to happen. Create, refresh, back to top, that's awesome, yeah. There's all kinds of buttons that help uh, help us navigate sites as users. And as users, we kind of expect buttons to do certain things. And they're real simple. There's usually only a couple words on them. And they, they're targeted to do uh, specific things. OK, so for this code, true or false, the above code will create a button that runs code when clicked. So um, in Zoom, you should see a. Uh, participants button, click that button and choose yes, the green check mark if you agree, if you think it's true, or choose no, the red button if you think it's false. I'm trying to go to my participants window. Not sure if I can see it. All right, what do you think, true or false? Yeah, you can throw it in the chat too if you're not able to find the button. Okay, good, so I'm seeing a lot of false, um, which makes me think that some of you do have uh, some web dev experience. This is kind of a tricky one for students, they might find it tricky because um, this, code does create a button. It creates a yellow button that has the display text run code, but no action takes place by default when a button is clicked. Actions must be added to buttons using JavaScript or by associating the button with a form. So um, this one's a little, was a little tricky. Um, the above code will create a button that is yellow, but it doesn't actually do anything until you program it. Okay, so using what you know about JavaScript and HTML, predict what the above code does. And you can go ahead and put this in the chat. It says raise your hand to speak, but I'm having some trouble with the Zoom function, but go ahead and um, put in the chat, using what you know about JavaScript and HTML, predict what the above code does. Awesome, got a few answers. Runs, uh, runs a function called my function when the button is clicked. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this will click and call the function my function. It will uh, create a button where the text says click here and it will um, call that function. Buttons are great for this because the user expects an action when clicking a button. So we can use JavaScript to add functionality to our websites and make them more dynamic. So yeah, we don't know what my function does yet. The programmer would have to write that in, but yeah, that is how that would work. 
Awesome, good job. Okay, so now we are going to start the lesson. Uh, it's 1.6, so just about in the middle of the web development uh, module. Um, I'll drop this in the chat, the link to the functions in HTML video or slides. So um, if students are working on this on their own, you can watch the video, but since we're here, you can uh, click slides on any video and follow along on the slides, and I'll be going over them up here as well. So in this lesson, we're going to learn about using JavaScript functions in HTML. So just to recap, and um, again, the first few uh, lessons will go over the script tag and the DOM in a lot more depth, but just a really quick um, background to get you up to speed. Um, the script tag is a way we can add JavaScript to our HTML code to add all the functionality of JavaScript to our websites. It should go at the bottom of the body tag in an HTML file. Um, so putting any code that you want to execute, you can write functions, variables, anything that you would write in JavaScript, and you can put it within two script HTML tags. And that would make um, the HTML page would know to read that as JavaScript. And that's how you can add JavaScript to your HTML page. And we're also going to just scratch the surface of the DOM. The document object model is a programming interface um, that represents HTML files as mutable objects. That means they can be changed. Mutable means you can modify it. Um, so the DOM is an interface that represents HTML files as mutable objects that can then be manipulated by programming languages such as JavaScript. So it turns the HTML file into the DOM tree, which is something that JavaScript can then, uh, you know, get into and you can modify you know you can modify the body you can modify header you can add elements remove them um do all kinds of things within the dom using javascript and we'll see how that can make pages a lot more dynamic than just hand coding you know html so first before we get started uh we'll go over an important concept in web development which is dynamic versus static so when we build websites without using javascript they are considered static Static websites remain largely unchanged by user interaction. So you can click around, you can, you know, they, they're, they're really, uh, you know, they can link to each other and they can have images and things like that, but um, they don't have a lot of interaction. They're kind of just to display information. Um, so for example, if you think about a website like a blog or an infographic, they're totally useful. They're not bad. Um, these types of sites are meant to be read and the only changes that really occur are when the owners decide to add information to the page. So if you wanted to um, make a change to that site, it would be the webmaster or the person who is uh, in charge of you know, making changes to the site. But otherwise the user can't really change anything about the site. They're just getting information from it. That would make that a static website. Yeah, so they're mostly text-based written in HTML. And up until this point in the course, we've mostly created static sites. But you can add JavaScript to your web pages to make them more dynamic. So a dynamic website um, will change and respond according to user input, which means clicking, you can be typing something, you can press keys to do certain things. Um, so that allows for a lot more interactivity, a lot more custom customization. And you can also store data um, Anything that would do those things would any, any number of those things would make the site more dynamic. So dynamic sites like Google and CodeHS are dynamic as they change and respond to user input and generate new pages based on user interaction. Um, codes, uh, sites like CodeHS and Google also store and collect data from users so that they can personalize their experience and save progress. Anytime you log in somewhere with a username and password, that's considered something that's dynamic because it does store it in a database somewhere and retrieve it. Um, you know, as you work on CodeHS, it'll save your code. That's, that's considered a dynamic function of a website. So in general, yeah, we can increase the usability and dynamic nature of our websites by adding functions. Functions are blocks of code that are designed to execute a particular task. Um, so we'll remember you can write a function in JavaScript by writing the keyword function and then giving the function a name in lower camel case. 
any code between the brackets will execute when the function name is called. We can also include parameters in our function. Variables and values that are input as parameters can then be used as the function. In this case, whatever value is placed in the function name will be printed out to the console. If you see console log there, um, whatever value is set as a parameter, that'll be printed to the developer's console, which we can take a look at in a little bit. So the point of using functions in general, if we remember from JavaScript, is that they can be reused to make code more efficient and easy to read. Because we don't just write code for computers, we also write them for other humans to be able to read and understand what's going on. And as a web developer, um, if you're finding you want to do the same thing over and over, you don't have to rewrite that code every time. You can make a function and then call the function whenever you want to reuse it. So if we're constantly adding new paragraphs to our website, you can create an add paragraph function that would allow you to repeat that action with less lines of code each time. Every, you could just call it, write it once and then call it whenever you need it. When add paragraph is called in the script, a new P tag will be created and then added to the document body. Um, so we're using the DOM here uh, called document um, and then creating an element P. So to create a new P uh, tag to insert into the document and then um, that line there, document.body.appendchild would add that, doc add that paragraph to the end of the body. So you wouldn't have to write that within HTML. You can actually add a new element. You can add a new paragraph using JavaScript. And that's what this function does. So you could make this function um, more generic, so not specific to doing one thing. Because uh, in, in general, in programming, we want to make our programs as general as we can, so we can reuse as much code as we can. Um, so you can make this function more generic and add the parameter ID. Now we can input any element type, and that element would be added to the document body. So for example, if you wanted to add uh, an H4 tag, um, a button, you know, any number of any HTML element, you can pass that as a parameter into this function and it would add it um, to the site using JavaScript. So now we're going to practice creating functions using buttons. The practical use of functions in web development is in the creation of buttons. We're going to practice uh, doing that now. So the button tag allows us to add buttons to a web page, like we just looked at um, in our opener discussion. So button is a built-in HTML function or built-in HTML tag that it recognizes. Um, so the, the simplest form is just putting text and wrapping it in button tags and it would just create an empty, well, a functionless button that says click me, but you would still be able to press that and it would look like a real button. It just wouldn't do anything yet until you tell it what to do. Um, since buttons are generally used to execute a task, they are perfect for learning about incorporating functions. The button created on the slide before is useless unless it does something. So we can give buttons more of a purpose by adding events to it. Events trigger actions in the browser. These events are often set to a function call. Um, a really common one, and the one we'll be looking at the most in this lesson, is an on click. So anytime you click on a website, um, that's an event, and you can write a script uh, when a specific element is clicked. So for example, if you want a button when it's clicked to execute my function, you can use code like this. In this case, the action that will occur when the button is clicked is the function, my function. If my function is defined in the script, then it will execute once the button is clicked. Um, so now that we know how to create an event, let's take a look and create a button that changes the color of a paragraph to red. So we'll walk through the code and then we'll take a look at the code editor. So here we have a document that just contains a P tag. So we got the um, body tag and then all that's in the body is a P tag uh, with the ID of P. The goal here is to change the color to red using a button. So first let's break this down into steps. That's really one of the key things about programming is thinking about the problem and decomposing it into smaller and more manageable steps. And especially with this web development course, 
a lot of the projects are kind of complex. And so you really want to practice um, just thinking like, what is the problem here? What am I trying to solve? So let's walk through this a little bit. The first step that we'll need to do here is create a button. Then we'll need to create an on-click event. And then we'll need to write the function to change the text color. Um, so within that function, the steps to making the function work as we would want it to would be to first find the p tag and then set the attribute to red. So first let's create the button. We can do so by using the button tag and placing the text click me in between the tags. So now we've got our button that doesn't have much going on, but we got a button. And then you can create the on click event. Um, we use on click to specify that the event should execute when the button is clicked. And we set on click to the name of the function that we want to execute. Let's call that function turn red for now. So now we just need to write turn red so that um, when we click it, it knows how to look up the definition and knows what to do when uh, we click turn red. So now that the event is created, um, we add a script tag so that we can put our JavaScript within that script tag. And then we write the function named turn red. So first, um, using the DOM, and you know, again, we'll go over this a little bit more, we need to find the p tag that we want to change colors, which in this case is the p tag with the ID p. So we'll use, um, we'll set that to a variable, document.getElementById with the ID of p. And then we want to style the color of the font red. We can do that using set attribute for the uh, dot style dot color notation. So for example, now that we um, have called, have, have this stored in a variable called p, that second line there, p dot style dot color would be modifying the attribute um, to, to make it red. We'll see how this looks like in the code editor. Here's a link to the example, and I'll open this up here as well. So this is the same that we just kind of broke out. Oh, actually, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, you can click here. Uh, so we'll see up here on line 14, we have the paragraph with the ID of P and the paragraph text just says change me. And then we've got our button. And when we click, uh, we, have, we, we put the on click and when we click it, it'll call the turn red function. So let's click it, turns red. So let's see what happens when we call turn red. It goes down here to the script and reads the function definition. And that's how it knows. Um, and then we'll go over in a, in a minute. There's another way to do this um, without on click. We can use it actually within JavaScript um, with an event listener. So that's down here um, on line 18. We have a similar, it says uh, it's the idea of P2, change me, but with an add event listener. And when you click it, it turns blue. And so we'll go down here um, so this is all within the script tag. You'll see that it's not actually adding a button with HTML. It's all down here in the script tag. So it creates a button. Um, it modifies the inner HTML of the button to be click me too. It adds an event listener. Um, so we take button that we created here within the DOM uh, and add an event listener called click. And then we write the function here for what we want to happen when we click it. So uh, we take, we call the document, we get the element P2, that's this element up here. And then we modify the style to make it blue. And then we um, append this to the bottom of the body. We've append the button here. And so both of these look the same to the user pretty much, but they're doing different things behind the scenes. One of them is, um, using relying on HTML a little more, and one of them do, is done completely within JavaScript using the DOM. So 
Well, we saw in that last one, rather than write events directly into HTML, we can add events to the element using the add, list, add event listener function. Let's take a little water. So the add event listener will add an event with a given function to execute to a given element. The way that we wrote the button on click attribute can be written similarly using the add event listener, but with a few key differences uh, just in the syntax and the way that JavaScript kind of parses it. Um, it looks similar, but there, there's, there are some key differences. So these both, both of these lines of code are pretty much the same thing, um, but you'll wanna uh, note that for add event listeners, the event value is input as a string and doesn't include the text on before the event type. So when adding events directly to HTML, on is required, whereas in JavaScript, on is not required. We just call it a click rather than on click. Um, you'll also notice that when you're writing just with HTML, you want to put parentheses there so that um, the function must be written with parentheses in that way. But when you are um, using the event, adding it to the event listener, you don't need to add parentheses. You can just put the name of the function when you're writing it within JavaScript. So those, those are just some key things to keep in mind. Um, they both have different purposes while you're doing it, but you might wanna to refer to this uh, later if you're doing one or the other, because they do have slightly different syntax for, for making the, uh, for doing the same thing. So with event listeners, we can also write the function directly into the function parameter. So you'll see here, um, so we had the, element dot add event listener and then we have it click and instead of calling a function just by its name you can write a function directly there so there is no function name you're just calling you're just writing function with an open set of brackets and then you have another set of curly brackets which indicates that's where you're writing the actual function everything is still enclosed in brackets so that everything within those brackets will be executed when the function is called so this is only useful if you don't intend to reuse the function at a later time. Um, if you only want this to happen one time, it might be the cleanest thing to have it all within one, you know, kind of neat call here. But um, if you want to reuse your code, you might want to define it separately. But it's just um, just something to know that you can write functions this way if that makes the most sense for what you are doing but it would be a pain to have to rewrite this every time you wanted to use a function because this only creates it within this specific um, event listener. So make sure you're careful to write these events based on the frequency that you would expect to give, uh, to call a given function. All right, so here's some of the concepts that we learned here. Um, and depending on your classroom, you and how you study best. You can add these to a vocabulary notebook that you're compiling. Um, you can add it to a word wall or a definition board. These would be all of the things that we covered in this lesson. Static, dynamic, uh, button, events, and then the two different types of um, how to add click events. So now it's your turn. We're gonna, um, if you are looking at the slides, you can go ahead and click continue at the end of the slides or click the quiz icon next to the video icon to navigate directly to the quiz. So here, um, here's the functions in HTML check for understanding quiz. I'll just give a few minutes to complete this. Um, I think it's, it's three questions. So um, just answer to the best of your ability and I'll just give a few minutes to get this one done. You get a freebie here on question two on, this, on, the, on the slide if you're looking.
Okay, we'll come back. Um, again, those are just to kind of see if you, uh, the, the way that to use these in the classroom is really to uh, see if they understood what they, um, what they just watched in the video, if they're doing it independently, or um, you could also use it as an exit ticket. Uh, if you went over the slides together, there's a lot of ways to use the quizzes, but they're not meant, they're just meant to correct it. And because they do give the answers, if they get it wrong, they do get an explanation right away. So it can really just be a really quick, like, oh no, I didn't quite get that right. Um, so now we'll go over another example. We went over the one uh, with the two buttons and the two different ways to uh, modify the, um, modify the color of the text. So we'll go over this example as well. So this is how to change text colors with parameters. This is an example in the, in the lesson. Um, so let's run it and see what it does. So use the buttons to change the color of this text. So we can probably make a prediction that we click red and it'll change it to red, click blue, it'll change it to blue. And then just walking through the code to see what is actually happening behind the scenes here. Um, so we've got this H4 text. We just got one line of text here in H4 with the ID color text. Um, and you'll see when you're using the code editor, if you double click um, the name of a variable or an attribute or anything like that, it'll highlight all the instances. So when I double click color text, I'll see that it also highlights down here um, within the function we can see that um, document.getElementById color text. So that's an easy way to find um, all the instances where it mentions the same ID or the same variable name or something like that. Um, so we've also got a button here. We've got two buttons. One is style equals color red. That means the uh, text, of the, text of the button is red. And on click, we change color and we pass it a parameter. And then same thing here, same button or same style, except we pass it the parameter blue. And so when we, with either of these buttons, they both have the same change color function, but they're passing different parameters into it. So uh, it calls change color, which accepts one parameter. And um, when you're inputting the parameter here, that's why it'll change blue or red. Um, so what it does is it takes this uh, color text ID, and modifies just this ID. So when, if you recall from CSS, you should really try to use only one ID per thing. They should be unique to that thing. And that's why in JavaScript, you can really just use the name of the ID to modify it. it makes it a lot easier if you um, keep your CSS in order that way. Um, and then, you know, if you wanted to, this should, if you want to pass another parameter and then run the code again, now it'll be yellow and super hard to read, which can be another segue of uh, talking to your students about color design. But in any case, a lot of ways to use these examples is to have students pick something to modify, and that'll help them parse the code and then also help them, you know, participate and, um, you know, pick something else, pick something out. And it could be something simple. It doesn't matter if it's simple or complex, but something just so they can interact with the code. Um, it can be a little, you know, don't have them just skip through them really fast. Like have them really dive into this line by line, go over with them while you're teaching it. Um, so, you know, they can, they can really connect like this line does this thing on the screen and this thing calls this function and this function does this thing. Um, the examples are really, really powerful tools um, either for students independently, but especially when you're doing it together as a class. Also, I wanted to show the docs tab. Um, so the docs for web development will have all of the stuff they've learned so far unique to web dev and a few JavaScript basics like the how to log to the console, um, how to get input from the user. Um, but the docs tab is also a really good thing to go over with your students. If you're forgetting something, like they don't have to memorize how to really do anything in programming. It's all gonna be available in documentation. And on CodeHS, we have a pretty simplified docs um, that's specific to what concepts they've covered in the course. So programmers use docs all the time in real life and on CodeHS, there's always gonna be this docs tab available too for just to quickly look up how to do a specific thing like set an alert and things like that. Cool. Um, 
So we're just going to take a look at what each exercise, there's three exercises in this lesson, and we're just going to take a quick look at what each exercise is asking us to do and to just break down the problem so that when students go into it, you know, on your own, um, you'll know how to start the problem. Because I think that can be something really intimidating is you're just looking at a blank code editor. It can be really helpful to um, walk through and help break down the problem. If you're not used to doing that on your own, you can do it as a class together. Um, so for this one, the announcement function, that's the first exercise after the coding examples. Um, you're going to write a function called announcement that adds an announcement to the document body. And an announcement is a message written in the H2 tag, at least within the context of this assignment. So you're just going to call announcement two times and add different text to it. And that's just for students to practice um, uh, using parameters um, with their functions. And then um, just to quickly go over the random number generator, in that exercise, you're going to create a button that generates a random number and adds it to a P tag using the DOM. So a lot of this, um, you will use a little HTML hard coding, but a lot of this course is really focused on using JavaScript to modify web pages. Um, and this, this one is no exception. So you're going to uh, you're going to uh, need to revisit friends, uh, your old friends, uh, math.random and math.floor JavaScript functions, but everything that you'll need to do is going to be in the docs. Um, and then we'll take a look at kind of a closer look at this last one. Um, so this is the third lesson in the course or third lesson, third activity in this lesson that they'll be doing coding on. So we'll take a closer look at this one. So this one's called add colors. Um, First, I want to take a look at the starter code. The starter code here gives us some style for the body and the divs, and um, also a skeleton for where to put our script. So we're not starting with a blank slate, which is always nice. Um, the starter code does give us something to work with. And then let's look at the assignment instructions together to really understand what this program should do and how to break down the problem. Um, OK. So on the assignment tab, you can look at the assignment directions at any time. And let's just kind of go over here. You can add comments to the top of any program that you're writing. Um, in HTML, the syntax is a caret and then that. And then this, this won't be um, read by the program. It'll, it can just be your kind of personal notes. And so, what I like to do when I'm looking at a program and it's kind of a more advanced one that I'm not sure how to do, I'll like I'll just look at it and see what it's asking me to do. Because a lot of times the answer is right there. So okay, we we are going to create a function called add color. Uh, prompts the user to add a color. Okay, so we're going to need user input. And if you forget how to do that, you can go over here to user input and see you know. Uh, ask th that can be how you um, prompt the user to enter something that you can use in your code. Back to the assignment tab. Okay, so we got a function that takes user input, like a color, and then appends a div with that background color. So we've already got our div defined here, um, and we're all we're going to do is change. So uh, append a new create. Let's see, create a new div. Using the um, using the user's color they chose, and then add color should execute when the button is clicked. Okay, so we create a button that you know you know, and when you're writing comments, it doesn't have to be real code. You know, it can be pseudocode. So we create a button. Oh, but what I just did is I uh, closed my comments. That's no good. So just one arrow there. So we create a button that. Uh, calls add color when clicked. And you can change it to like on click for a reminder to yourself. Don't worry about styling the head unless you want to play around with it. Okay, so that's an option. But that's just one way to use these as well to go over your, um, go over it, write something at the top as just like a little to-do list for if you have kind of a more multi-step problem, break down the problem into multiple steps. And then it, it's just easier to get started that way. It's almost like writing an outline for an essay. Um, if you're not sure where to start, just start um, with an outline and write yourself little notes, and that can be a way to get started. Um, so when it's done, you should be able to click this button 
any number of times. And every time you click it, it will add a new color uh, to the bottom. It will append that background color to the div at the bottom. And yeah, so that's that's how that will look when it is done. Great, so that's pretty much it for the um, student view of the lesson. Um, so we'll go into a little bit of how I plan that with some strategies. Um, so you'll see here, so for the video, there's some, th this is just a table of options of how to use each activity type on CodeHS. And there's more possibilities as well, but I'll just kind of go over the ones that I use during this lesson. And then um, how you can use different ones based on the needs of your students and to kind of change up the flow of your class, any, you know, any number of things that you can modify. So for the video today, Everything in blue is the stuff that I did today. So I taught through the slides, but you can also watch individually in class or flipped depending on your model um, and your time constraints. Or you can watch the video all together as a class and have a discussion after that way. Um, for the coding examples, you can delete it and start with a blank editor and write examples together with your students. Um, I will say that for my own personal coding level, I'm not able to do that for every level of the exercise and that's fine. So like, you don't have to expect yourself to do that every time. But if you're teaching um, a less advanced course and you do feel confident starting from scratch, that can be really valuable for students. But um, what we did in highlighted in blue here is we explored it as a class and just kind of went by, line by line and you can um, ask questions for discussion and modify things, pick some, have, call on someone and have them pick one thing in the code to modify and see what it does. And if it breaks the code, that's fine. Uh, making mistakes is normal too. Um, you can go through the example as a self-paced exploration with a worksheet. You can have them explore it on their own. There's a number of ways to use examples. For the exercises, those are the actual coding parts. Um, you can complete those individually. You can do them in small groups or you can do them using pair programming. That's when you have uh, students pair up and one person um, does the typing and the other person is kind of coming up with the ideas and they share that way and they can work through a lot that way. And then as far as lesson openers and closers, um, we did some discussion questions at the beginning. You can also do them at the end. You can also do the uh, check for understanding quiz at the end as sort of an exit ticket. And there's also handouts um, included in the pro plan and a lot of the lesson plans that can be really good as closers. Sometimes openers, you'll do want to preview it to see if it's like practicing something kind of in the middle of the lesson. Sometimes it's like a pre-knowledge thing. Sometimes it's like they should do it at the end to really solidify it. So you will want to preview it, but I'll show you an example of one for this lesson um, that is sort of intended to be towards the end of the lesson to help them uh, really solidify the concepts. Um, so here's an example of the handout for this lesson. So it really helps them explore this on-click versus event listener. Offline activities can be super helpful in a computer science class. Um, you know, so much of what they do is, you know, obviously with computers and it's that's kind of unavoidable, but sometimes it is really nice to have them think about it in another way, hand write things out, write out their logic in kind of plain English. Um, so they're supplemental, they can be used as a daily warm up, exit tickets, homework, group work, so much more that you can do with these handouts. Um, this lesson has a handouts where students explore, um, you know, using the on-click versus an event listener. And then lesson plans. Um, we have an example of a lesson plan for functions in HTML. Um, and these give discussion questions. They give uh, suggestions for class openers and closes, closers. They will give suggestions for structuring the lesson and the suggested pacing and time frame, which everything is modified, you know, able to be modified. They also give solution references. Um, accommodations if needed, standards alignment, um, objectives. There's all kinds of stuff packed into those lesson plans. And we will be diving more into those later um, if that's if you're interested in learning more uh, to join the breakout room about tools. I can go over and answer any questions about lesson plans that you would have. But um, in general, it is your turn. So take a few minutes and just look through the previous lessons in the first web dev module. Um, so as you're looking through, you can look through the lesson plans. You can try out some of the coding if you felt comfortable doing that. You can look through the projects and see what you're most excited about. So just take a few minutes. Um, and then if you're willing, 
come back and just share something in the chat, um, an assignment or aspect of the course that you're excited about, something that you'd like to add or look into further, and any challenges you're anticipating. So just think about those, take a few minutes to dive through the materials that have been out so far, and I'll stop talking. And then in a few minutes, we'll just see, you know, and if, if something comes up, just throw it in the chat, that's fine too. So I'll give a few minutes just to, just to kind of explore the resources that are available.
Okay, another 30 seconds or so to explore the course. And as you're coming back, feel free to throw anything in the chat, something that you are excited about or interested in or any challenges that you think might come up as you're teaching this. We did have uh, Kent point out the boot camp, which is definitely um, yeah something you you can assign both modules in full if you wanted to, if you really wanted them to be ready, or you can have them just available for students and optional. And if they find as they're working that they need to brush up on a specific topic, it'll be there for them to poke through. Um, yeah, definitely enjoy the. Boot camps. Um, I do see a question coming in in the parking lot about uh, getting them all, making sure they're working on something that's relevant. And honestly, I think that's one of the fun parts about web design and web development is that you can, um, we'll go over this tool in just a sec. Actually, it's the next slide, the codehs.me pages. Um, so, uh, I've seen so many cool student websites and you can really have them do them on any topic that they want. If it's like some anime show they're really into, a local restaurant or cafe or small business, um, you can have them do it on a personal interest if you think that would get them more engaged or you can have them you know, pick, uh, pick a purpose for their website if you think that would get them more engaged. I think the beauty of web design is that they can really be as creative as they want and doing the web dev um, they can really make it functional and, and like a real world project. So I'll show, if you haven't used codehs.me, um, students can create their own custom homepages on CodeHS. So here's an example from Carol, which is a static homepage, which we learned about. So um, this isn't even the half of what they could do. They can build entire sites, they can add multiple files. Um, so yeah, the code just that me is something they can activate and create. And as they learn more in web development, they can start adding JavaScript to make their code just that me sites more dynamic. And they can add links or add pages um, that link to the stuff they've worked on in the course. And I think in like web development and web design are perfect courses for project based learning and having the having the students choose what they are really excited to to learn about if they want to do a website on their favorite band to get started or you know something that whatever they're excited about their video games um that's a totally legitimate way to get them engaged and um i th i think personally web dev is just like really um so easy so conducive to uh project based learning and getting getting having them find something that's relevant to them um so you know they'll, they'll learn the skills kind of the harder skills of javascript the, the hard skills of uh you know making this button functional and stuff like that, but then they can apply it to their own codehs.me page that can really be about anything they want. And I think that's kind of the magic of it. Um, so to create your own codehs.me page, um, you'll click, click into the sandbox and your students will have the same view as well. So you as the teacher can make one and your students will all have access to it. This is free, this is definitely a free feature. Um, and then click the green edit homepage button to set up your codehs.me page, you might have to change your username because there's certain characters that aren't allowed. Um, and by default, the codehs.me pages are public. If you are on pro, you will be able to make them private. But the key thing is that every, um, every student has this ability and they can create their own custom, you know, carol.codehs.me, but it'll be their own username that they pick and they can build an entire website with, um, you know, multimedia files, multiple pages, links, and like an entire web linking to each other. And as they start learning JavaScript, they can add JavaScript to their pages as well. Um, so here's an example of a uh, word game that uh, was created in web development. So this is an example of a word game that students would be able to create after doing web dev for a little while then they can add this as a page to their codehs.me sites. Um, so feel free to fork this. If you see this fork button up here, this will create a copy of this program to your own sandbox, which you can then um, modify without modifying the original program. So if you fork it, you, it'll make a copy into your sandbox and you can use that later. You can assign it to your students, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but basically, yeah, so this is this was created in web dev and we see the same kind of structure that we saw in the exercises. It's a word guess game in JavaScript. So, you know, M, sorry, that's not one of the letters. And then O, and you can see here how it was designed using the same uh, function and letter events that, uh, I mean, key, uh, key events that we saw earlier. So this is absolutely something, um, this is just one page, but you can absolutely, you know, go up here and create a new file. Uh, and, you know, you can create a whole website this way and codehs.me allows your students to share it. And it's a public thing. And I think at, when students are learning it, you know, they just feel really good about it. Like they can tell their parents, tell their friends, school showcase, you know, go to my website, create a QR code for it. It's, it's really cool stuff. They can get really engaged with it. All right. Um, up next, we do have the, um, breakout room options. So you will have a choice. If you want to hang out with me here in the main room, I'm gonna go over uh, some CodeHS teacher tools and resources. And if you want to chat with other teachers about how to best use this content in your classroom, so more of a curriculum chat, you can join breakout room too. We will also have uh, Linda in there as well, and I believe Portia to help answer any questions that you might have about the content, about the curriculum itself. Um, so breakout room two would be for if you want to um, chat with other teachers about using web dev, teaching web dev, asking questions about the curriculum. If you want to learn more about tools like, uh, you know, grading and navigating the site and different features, um, you could hang out here with me. So are these breakout rooms? I have not set up these rooms. I'm going to go ahead and set them up. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so just note, um, if you see there at the top right corner of that um, that slide that MR has up currently, um, we really are only going to have one room. So the main room um, is where MR is going to go over teacher tools, resources. Um, MR, they specifically asked about like how to create a section. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Um, totally. Something that uh, somebody specifically asked in the question parking lot. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, create this one room breakout. Um, and again, you can feel free. Let me see if I can rename this section curriculum chat. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms. Feel free to hop in whichever one um, you'd like to be in. So you can stay in the main room, which doesn't require you to click on the join. And if you'd like to join uh, Portia and myself, we're going to hop into um, the breakout room called curriculum chat. See you there, everyone. Cool, I'll give just a minute or so to move if you'd like to move. If you have trouble moving, um, drop a note in the chat, our team will pop you over. But if you're staying here, I am guessing that you want to learn more about the tools, which is wonderful. And I can start off by just walking through creating a section. So I'm gonna get my like window life together here. I have so many windows all over all my pages. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I paused for a sec. Sorry about that. Reshare. So I moved it to my another screen and now it's a mess. Okay, that should work. Um, Great, so we're gonna go over creating courses, creating sections, enrolling students, and then managing those sections. And then if anything comes up, I'm happy to go over it with whatever time we have remaining. Um, so first uh, we'll go over creating a course. So I'm going to actually, walk us through this, okay. So you want to navigate to courses on the left-hand navigation bar. And then, um, so I have a bunch of courses here. You will want to, uh, the first step is just to name your new course. So you can call it example web development and then create the new course. So you'll have this option where um, Basically, have two options for a starting point. Um, 
The first one is to use an existing Code HS course as a template for the course. So that will populate all the assignments for that course. Um, I would say this is probably what I would recommend for most teachers, especially newer ones. If this is your first year on Code HS, definitely start with what's already there. You can pull in stuff later, you can take stuff out, but I would probably um, start with just the full year course or you know, whoever length of your classroom. That's probably what I would recommend is to choose the course template. Um, you can also start from scratch and that'll just be an empty course that you can add things to over time. You can create your own custom assignments and this is all available on the free plan. I'll let you know if something is pro, but so far everything we're doing is available on free. Um, so I'll, I'll do this top one because I think that's probably what most of you will be doing. So choose course template and then you can filter by um, the name of the course. So there's only one web development course if you're doing web design, there are a few versions, but you can always view the syllabus and see if you are, you know, make sure that you're choosing one that's appropriate for the grade level you're teaching and for the length if you want a semester versus a year long. But for web dev, there's only one. So you can go ahead and choose that. So that'll populate the new course. And we'll see it here. So I have so many. So you'll notice that I have this example web development course. So I'm gonna open this in a new tab. Um, and while that loads, I just want you to notice that right now there's no sections attached to it. So what that means is there's no classrooms, there's no rosters attached to this course. The course is actually just the course of assignments. So it did populate all of the um, all of the modules and lessons and activities for the course. And this is the teacher view. So you'll see um, the links will, it's pretty much the same as a student view, but the links will be more towards teachers. You can uh, go to the lesson plan here the problem guide link is here. You can preview here, um, configure the assignment here. Um, but the layout is pretty much the same as the student view. So now that this is your course with all the assignments, um, one thing I wanna point out while I'm here is you can search for content, which will um, show you the boot camps or any supplemental and optional modules you can assign them here as well so scrolling to the bottom of your assignments page on your course and clicking search for content and then um, this will show you any of the relevant um, supplemental materials so back to my courses page where i'm gonna uh, create a section i'll show you how to do that from the courses page. There's a couple ways to do it and I'll show you from the courses, whoops, from the courses page. So I'm here in my example web development section. I'm gonna click this create a new section right from the courses page. So this is where you'll actually enroll your students. So you can call it sample web dev section. Um, you can also import it from Google Classroom. If you have that set up, you can import and sync your rosters directly from Google Classroom. If you don't, um, which is how I'll demo it now, you can invite your students and I'll show you how to do that. So now you've created the section, so let's view it. Great, so now this is your section where you can enroll the students and when they enroll, they'll see this course that you set up with all the assignments and all any additional stuff that you've put in there. Um, right now we've got zero students. Um, if you want to invite students, you can look up here if you have students already, it might be collapsed, but this bar here, uh, this uh, phrase here will be the same, how students can join the section and you can expand this for um, the link. And if you, send, if you send this link to your students, they can click it and um, it will join the section. It will tell them who's the teacher, what course it is, and do they want, you know, confirm that they want to join it. If they have an account already, um, it will enroll them in two sections. So they can be in multiple sections. That is totally fine for students. If they don't have an account, it will just be a couple extra fields like having them you know, enter their name and their email um, or signing in with Google if they have a Google account. So that will create an account for them if they don't have one or just enroll them in multiple sections if they do. You can also do invite via email. It's the same link. These are both the same link. It'll just um, generate an email that uh, you, know, you can paste your class list here and it'll be an email message, so it'll be in their email. So that's kind of just up to you and you know, maybe your school if you have different ways of communicating, but it will send the same link. It's the same join link. 
Another way to create a section is just when you log on to codehs.com, up here, and depending on how many sections you have, you'll see this create new section button. Um, if you don't have any sections, it'll be just the only thing on your page, so it'll be easy to find. But if you do have sections, it'll be there as well. And you can create a section here the same way. Uh, and if you are doing it this way, because we didn't choose a course yet, so that'll be the next step. So for here, I'm creating the section, which is the roster of students. And again, I can import from Google Classroom at this step, or you can just enroll them later. So then you'll choose the main course. Um, you can filter by high school or middle school. Um, you can go back to all, and you can choose any of these courses. And that will create a new section, and that will be on your um, sections page when you log into CodeHS. So let me go back here. So we went through creating courses. Um, great, yeah. So. Um, every class section has a class code. If the students do need to enter it, you'll always see it on the sections page there. Um, and they can join a section by confirming that code. But if they click the link, it'll all be populated for them and they can just confirm that that's what they're doing. Um, so to manage your, uh, actually this is, I'm gonna go, I saw a question come in about um, how could I check or edit my students' work while they are open together? Um, so one thing you can do on the free plan um, is go in, so I'll find this web dev section. So this is the section, I'm on the section page and I can go onto any students. Um, I'll go to my, I'll go to Ursula up here. I can go to any student's page Ursula's on the Code HS team here, just hanging out. Um, so then I'm loading up their assignments page. So this is what your students see when they log into Code HS. Um, so you can see that this is their current section. If they are enrolled in multiple sections, you'll see they can choose which one over here. And this is what they see when they log into Code HS. So um, I, as the teacher viewing their assignments page, I can navigate, expand the modules, and click to any um, exercise and load the quiz. So I can see this teal here. Um, the color coding is teal means it's finalized. They completed it. There's nothing left to do. Um, yellow means they opened it but didn't finish it. And gray means they didn't open it at all. These pink and maroon buttons mean that the, you as a teacher graded it and said that this needs a little more work. You can send it back to them. So I can open up this quiz from Ursula and see you know, how she scored on the quiz. Um, so that's one way to view quizzes. And then as far as exercises go, um, I can see that she didn't finish this, but I can still give her a grade if I wanted. Um, over here on the grade tab, um, I can see that there's no grade yet. She didn't submit it, but if I wanted to, I can give her a three out of five. Actually, I'll just go ahead and give her a five out of five and give her some feedback. Great job. Um, and Mark is finalized. And now you'll see, you know, clicking through these tabs up here, you can go to the grade tab on any assignment at any time and see um, this was finalized at this time um, here's the grade that it got. And um, yeah, so that's how you can do that for individual students. If you do have um, the pro plan um, over here in code review, you will see um, Oh gosh, it's going to take take a minute to load with zoom here. Code review will open up. So I have a ton of sections here. You know, you may or may not have a ton of sections, but any section that has the pro plan will have um, this fast grade, op fast grade option. And that will let you go through, um, 
your grading a lot faster. So I can open it up. I don't think there's anything in it. Um, yeah, so that's maybe not a good example. Sorry about that. So uh, I can actually going to share my, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and open up a different page. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I chose my coworker um, so I wouldn't put anyone uh, on the spot because I know that wasn't really the point of that exercise. I'm not here to judge anyone's coding performance. Um, okay, so, so now I'm gonna go to code review and there should be something populated in fast grade for this one. Oh, but there isn't. Okay, um, sorry about that. Maybe demo section. There we go, okay. So um, if you have pro, um, you can go over here to fast grade and it's a really cool feature to help you get through your grading a lot quicker. So you'll see um, this is the uh, student code here. That's what they submitted. And then the solution code here to compare it. And you have all these tools over here. You can look at the um, any info that you need for shortcuts. The assignment description is here. So you can remember what the assignment was supposed to be doing, a rubric if there is one. And then you can just run the code um, to make sure that the program works as expected. And all of the options that we just saw on the grade tab, which is available on free, on pro, it's all here um, really quickly. So uh, we can open it in a new window if we want to see the whole thing. We can skip it, or we can award full credit, give a zero, finalize it, or say, this needs some work. Can you add comments to it or something? So we can go ahead and award full credit for that. Perfect. And it takes us to the next one, and you can get through your grading a lot quicker with pro, with uh, fast grade. Um, on the free plan, another a, a feature that is nice is students are able to send you help questions, and if they do, you can go right here to your dashboard, and then click help mode, and this will open the question. This will open the code editor with the question. So. Anytime when a student is working on Code HS, they can go to more conversation. And they're able to send you a message. So students have this view as well. They can, anytime that they're working on Code HS, they can go to more conversation and send you a message as a teacher and it'll appear in your inbox up here. And also in that help section uh, on the other, in, in, on, on the code review dashboard in the help section. Um, so the student submitted this question. I don't get this. I have turned right in my code, but it's not working. You as the teacher can type an answer here. Keep it up. Um, yes, you will have access to this recording. So answer Lisa. Um, so yeah, you can send this as the teacher and that will answer the question and take you back to the dashboard. So let's go back. Um, Let's take a look at uh, customizing some of these assignments. So I'll go back anytime you're on Code HS, you can click here to take you back to the home page. So if you want to customize assignments, let's say for example, um, you want to rearrange some of the assignments that you've put out, you can click into the section and click on assignments up here. And then, uh, you know, let's go back to maybe not mess up this, um, let's go to it, an example course. So I'm not messing up the active section that you're in. So I'm going to the course assignments page and on here um, you can search for content and assign any of these. So again, this is gonna be the uh, supplemental modules that are the most relevant to this course. So you can assign the midterm here and if you have pro, you will have access to more of these options, but you will still be able to assign it um, without pro on the free plan. You can definitely assign any of these modules, but some of these um, grade book and due date settings will not be available, but you can always assign any curriculum from all of CodeHS is gonna be free. So I just assigned a supplemental module. So let's go ahead and preview the course. So you'll see it appears at the bottom here. 
but this was the midterm model module. So I probably don't want this at the bottom of the course. I probably want this somewhere in the middle. What you can do is go back to the top up here and click edit. And now you're in edit mode and you can drag and drop any of these modules. So I want the midterm to be more in the middle. Yeah, right after animation and games, that sounds great. And then I can go up here and press done when I'm done reordering it. Um, you can also click the three dots and access a lot of menu this way. Uh, so you can move up from this three dot menu, move it up or move it back down. Um, you can also copy a link. So any student that's enrolled in this course, this link will work for them and they can get to this module directly. Um, you can preview it if you want to, uh, let's say, for example, if you want to see what it looks like from the student point of view. Um, this one is locked, of course. Uh, let's try categories and triangles. With the pro plan, you can also lock assignments um, from your students so that if, they, if you wanted to, um, you can keep things locked until you're ready to unlock it. That is a pro feature, um, not available on the free plan. On the free plan, everything is available to all students all the time. <laughs> Um, so this was, I previewed this categorizing triangles uh, module and it took me to the module um, student view. So I can see both lessons already and I can click let's go and start on any of these lessons. Um, say if I wanna to go to the example. So this can be really handy um, as a teacher for if you wanna um, work through the curriculum as a student. Um, you can stay, you know, just work ahead of them, work on pace with them. Really good way to uh, preview the curriculum. Um, another thing you can do if you want to preview the curriculum at any time, uh, up here where you see teacher, that's gonna be the default view if you are a teacher, but you can also go to student and see any sections that you are enrolled in as a student. And then you can work through the course as your students would see it. Um, and that's an excellent way to learn pretty much any topic on CodeHS. I definitely recommend uh, enrolling in a course as a student. And um, I can show you how to do that as well. So up here on my courses, you'll see all the same sections. And if you scroll to the bottom, my demo account is enrolled in a ton, but you can go to the bottom of your list and click view course catalog. And I opened it in the new tab so here's our entire course catalog. And let's say, you know, you want to explore a, a virtual reality. What you can do if you don't, if you haven't really decided if you want to assign this to your students yet, you don't want to create a section, you don't want to assign it to your students and you just kind of want to preview it and learn it yourself, go ahead and click enroll. And then now you're enrolled in this course and you can, um, click view to view your student page. And now you can work through it as a student. And again, to access this, so if you'll see here, um, your drop down up here is the student view. Uh, I see a question from Daniel to use the service as a student. Do I need to use another email for another account? No, so this is all still tied to your same account. Um, so all you do is up here in the drop down, switch from teacher to student. So you can keep, you can keep it all in one account. Um, and you can keep your student progress separate from, you know, your, teach, your teacher tools and things like that. Um, but you'll see the uh, course that I just enrolled in. Here's my student dashboard. I can see it right here. And again, for you, probably you're enrolled in fewer uh, courses than my demo account is. But here's the course that I just enrolled in. So that's an awesome way um, if you're new or um, if you're a new teacher, especially, but even if you're advanced and you want to check out some of our, we have some like shorter courses you can check out, um, tons of stuff you can do and uh, preview as, a, as your students would. Um, so let's get back to the assignments page. And let's say you uh, wanted to remove stuff from your page. You can go over here to the three dots again Anytime you see these three dots, this pretty much means it'll be all the options available. Um, if it is pro features, you'll see it has a pro badge up here, but a lot of, there is a lot of stuff available on free. So you can remove anything, delete the module, yes. Um, 
And one other thing that I think is really useful uh, that I get asked a lot is how can you add things from different courses? That is definitely something you can do. Um, so let's say, you know, when you're creating your course, you did choose the course template. So it has the main um, Carol modules, um, but let's say you wanted to add uh, one, you know, web design module. So you can go up here to the add button and uh, these three up here will allow you to create your own blank module, blank lesson, blank assignment, if you really wanted to go all in and create all your own activities. But if you wanted to use existing activities, um, you can go to CodeHS content. And let's say, so this is my JavaScript course uh, for you know maybe my ninth grade class and I do want to intro them, just scratch the surface of web design. I can go uh, type web design in the filter here and the click this one. And um, so you can assign the entire course if you wanted to. You can select all main content or you can select all supplemental content and that'll select everything down here in the supplemental modules. Um, I'm gonna deselect them. But if you wanted to uh, only assign a certain thing, let's say only this HTML module, you can assign the whole module or you can expand the lessons and assign, you know, just half of them. And so this will assign, you know, lessons 3.1 to 3.6. So you go back up here and assign the things that you selected. Great. And now I'm going to view the assignments in this course so you can see how it looks. Uh, when it's assigned. Okay. Um, so we'll see down here. It added this module with just the six lessons that I selected. So that can be a way that you can you can pull from anything in the course catalog. And that's a really good way if you you know get to the end of the year and your students are asking about a particular topic, you maybe want to preview something else or you want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you can pull from any course that we have in the course catalog. You can just pick and choose and create your own course that way. Um, and again, you can remove anything, like say, for example, if you uh, in a previous life assigned this already in the demo, you can remove it so that you don't have two of the same thing. Um, I saw a question come in, would this be considered a beginning course? Uh, the, the, the course that we went over today, web development is not a beginning course. I would not recommend that for like absolute beginners. Um, but web design, and I can show the, uh, so if you go up here as a teacher, your toolbox, the quick way to get to the course catalog um, is the resources tab and course catalog. Uh, web development, I would say is not a beginner course, but the web design course where they learn the basics of HTML and CSS, that is a beginner course. Uh, and we have a high school level and we also have a um, middle school level as well, if I filter it up here by middle school. Um, you will see these web, web design middle school options. So you can do a quarter long course, uh, 160 hours, four years for middle school. So there's, there's lots of options. I would say web design is a beginner's course and intro to JavaScript is a beginner course for about ninth grade, ninth or 10th grade, I would say is, is good for JavaScript. Um, so yeah, the, the pathway for web dev is traditionally one year of web design. So they have a full year of HTML and CSS and one year of intro to JavaScript. And then they can do the web development, which we went over today. Um, but it is pretty advanced. And I would say uh, you could theoretically do it with just the bootcamp modules if you think your students are ready for it. But I would say that uh, having done it like as an adult, it is an advanced course. So I would, to, to, I think to set your students up for success the best, um, I, would, I would probably make it as part of a three-year pathway where they do have the full year of web design, the full year of JavaScript. And um, then this is kind of their third year of web development. I think that would be probably the most successful for most students. But if you do have a set of like advanced students who have some coding background or who just are very active and motivated, I think they could do it with just the bootcamp modules. Um, but just just a kind of a disclaimer that it would be tricky. Um, so with Matisse, Dali, and Picasso, um, so you'll see on CodeHS in our catalog uh, courses that are similar. 
have different kind of versions depending on the length. So for, uh, go back to, so um, for JavaScripts, they're all named after dogs. So there's the golden retriever course. Um, there's the, uh, I think there's the collie course, the bulldog course. And for um, web design, they're all named after artists or designers. So it really just refers to different versions of the course. Picasso is the standard full length high school course that I would say is probably best for ninth or 10th grade, really at any point, but you know, that's, that's around it. And then um, the other uh, versions, Monet is a semester long high school course. Dali is a quarter long middle school course and Matisse is a year long middle school course. So the, um, the uh, Matisse and Dali, that just refers to the different versions of the course. Um, I did get a question, will we have a beginner's course training? Uh, we did just have a web design training. Um, I would say the, keep an eye out for the link to the um, virtual, uh, for all of the virtual events, because we, I do believe we had one on just web design. So that would be more of the beginner's course. Um, so we, we do often have them for different courses. Um, yeah, the web design, it should be in YouTube. I can try to send that to you, Felipe, after this. Uh, let's see. And then I do want to show a little bit about creating your own content in a few minutes. So I think this is one of the most powerful features on CodeHS. Um, it's honestly, it's really similar to what our curriculum developers use. So when you go to the create dashboard, you can uh, go down here and create a new assignment. And you can choose from a different types. You can do a coding exercise. So that'll be like a sandbox problem. Um, like when we saw earlier, uh, anything with, with involving encoding and you can set up starter code for them. You can write a description so they'll know what to do. Um, so it's an open-ended sandbox style coding project, and that'll be an assignment and it can be graded. It can be, uh, you can get feedback on it. Everything that you would do with a normal CodeHS assignment, but it's something that you create. And we also have all of these different program types. Um, a quiz, uh, similar to the multiple choice uh, quizzes. So it'll be the same format of everything else in the course. So your students will uh, have the same, have the same uh, format. Um, a video, you can embed a video from YouTube or wherever you embed videos. Um, an article is another one. You can embed a PDF or another web page. Notes is lecture notes, um, free response. Embed is really awesome if you use something like a uh, Padlet or Jamboard or uh, any anything that you already use in your teaching. You can go here um, and embed the code here and this will create an assignment where your students can easily access um, easily access anything. And I know we just kind of scratched the surface on a lot of these today. So the main last thing I want to close with is, let's say you're new to CodeHS or you're advanced on CodeHS and you don't know where to go for help. I think the best tool that we have is over here, the support button. Um, and on most pages as well, you'll see this blue chat. On some pages it's disabled just so it's not in the way of things, but on most pages you will see this chat button, which will connect you to our team. Um, our support team is amazing. And I can say that because I used to be on our support team. They're super helpful. Um, you can search our knowledge base. So basically anything that we talked about here today, uh, you know, for example, create, you can, uh, you know, see all of the help articles that we have on this topic and learn more about it. Um, and again, on the support tab, you can contact us directly. This will just open up the chat box. Uh, you can go back and if we don't have what you're looking for in the knowledge base, you can just start a new message here. And our team is pretty quick. It's not quite instant, but it is really quick and super good, super friendly, super knowledgeable, really good stuff. Um, the knowledge base is just a vast collection of help articles on basically anything you would want. The teacher forum connects you with other teachers on CodeHS who are teaching it in their classrooms. You can make new threads and see what other teachers have done in the past. Um, you can also browse and see any a number of topics. Um, and then, yeah, these down here will help get you in touch with our team if you are interested in the pro plan. 
uh, bringing it to your school, working with your admins to bring Pro. The Pro does have a ton of lesson plans and resources and grading tools that are pretty advanced. I tried to focus on the free stuff because I know most of you are um, free teachers. Um, so I think if we have, I think that's about all I, all I had. Did want to close off with the support because really anything that you have questions about, that's a good way to finish up. So let's, I'm gonna throw it back to Linda to wrap up. That sound good? Okay. All right, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, I know um, it definitely is a lot um, to come and do some PD in the middle of summer. And uh, I'm so grateful that everyone took a break and, uh, and came and joined us today. So um, I just want to remind you, um, we still have the question parking lot available. If uh, you know if you have questions or you drop them in there, um, go back and make sure that you check it again. Um, so we can throw that link back in the chat, um, just so that you have that for future reference. If there is any um, additional questions though, definitely email us. You can email me at lynda at codehs.com if you have specific questions. Um, I would be happy to help in any way that I can. A um, couple more resources. We do have more free, D, free PD coming up. Um, so that's next week. Um, and we have both teacher trainer led workshops and code HS led work workshops. Um, Kent Pendleton is in here and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Kent. He is a teacher trainer and did an amazing job last week. So thank you, Kent. Um, and thank you, Mary, for dropping that link into the chat too. She, uh, she dropped that YouTube link to his recording. Um, one last thing before you go, if you could just uh, let us know how we did. Um, let us know how we can support you in the future as well. Um, we have a workshop survey. You just go to codehs.com forward slash workshop survey. And um, you'll see that both in the chat, but if you'd like, you can also um, access that from the question document that uh, we had from the beginning here. So if we go back here, wow, it's, uh, we have quite a bit of answers. Okay, um, the workshop uh, link is right here, that end of workshop survey. So we are um, happy to help in any way we can and we're so grateful that you joined us today um, if you have additional questions you can hang out for a few minutes and um, thank you again for everyone for joining and i just dropped that link in the chat too thank you everyone have a wonderful afternoon.